and welcome to A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie here on Black Star Network. Today, we are going to have some stimulating conversation around reading and books and print materials. I know some of us are so accustomed to having our cell phone, our other digital devices in our hands, that oftentimes we forget the value of the feel and the smell of the printed page. Today, we're going to have a conversation with Ramonda and Derek Young, who are the owners of Mahogany Books. They're going to talk to us about how they built their dream, what it means to be living their purpose, and all of the wonderful things surrounding reading. We're also going to be joined today by our contributors, Dr. Tierney, our Level Up coach, and of course, our educator extraordinaire, Stacey Owens. Come on in, everyone. How's it going? Hey, how Hello. are you? Thanks. I am doing well. It's really good to see each of you here. And, you know, spring break has ended and people are out and about. But every now and then we like to curl up with a good book. And I want to ask each of you this and around Robin. I won't say what is the last thing you read, but what is one of your favorite books and why do you read it? Um, I'll start with Stacy. <laughs> oh, boy, let's see. For the last two years, I have only been reading books around the teacher-student relationships because of this dissertation. <laughs> but I would say when um, when I was a child, for some reason, uh, Hey God, it's, it's Me, Margaret was one of my favorite books. And I think that because it helped with some of those transitional things that you're going on, that, goes, that you have going on as teenagers, it helped to make sense to that. So books is 
can be used as that mechanism to help you to figure out what's going on in your life as you look at what's happening in the lives of the different characters. Mm, I like that because that was a very pivotal book. It's one of those turning point resources that you can read at different stages in your life as you're going through your personal, you know, physical development as a young person. Dr. Tierney, what are you reading or what have you read recently that was um, significant to you? So I absolutely hear Stacy and being in the dissertation phase and reading all of those textbooks. Once I finished my PhD and got my doctorate and became Dr. Tierney, I didn't want to read anything of significance, nothing heavy, no poignant, amazing novels. No, I want it all junk food reading. One of the books that I've read recently, The Seven Husbands of, of Evelyn Hugo, it was really fun, really light, you know, comical. And, you know, I love those type of mysteries and books like that. But the book series that is my absolute favorite that I go back and reread from time to time, nobody judge me, it's the Harry Potter series. <laughs> That series, even the movies, like I love it. And I love it for a number of reasons, just the fantasy, just being able to go to a completely different world. But the main reason why I love it is because my grandmother is a, was a substitute teacher. And so they would have the book fairs at school. And um, I was a sophomore in college, I believe, when the first um, books were released. And so she read it and I thought it was a kid's book. And so she literally paid me $20 to read the first book she knew I wouldn't read it, you know, and so I read the first book and then it became our thing. So every time a new one was released, I would go on Amazon and order one for her and for myself and we would read it and talk about it. And so the Harry Potter series has a special place in my heart. Um, one, because it's, it's just a really good book, you know, but also because it's a, a book that my grandmother and I shared and loved together. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Now, you know, reading breeds critical thinking creativity, imagination, and innovation. And of course, we're going to do a one-on-one -on -one, um, in another block with Derek and Ramonda. But for now, I want to ask Derek, what are you reading or what have you read? And what does it mean to you, um, the things that you do read, Derek? Well, I mean, you ask a bookseller that, I'm not quite sure where to start. Um, I'll, I'll go with what really I think defined me as a person. Um, it's a book I read in college, uh, The Revolution, Revolutionary Suicide by Huey P. Newton. Um, that book just basically changed my life. Uh, it gave me the purpose, um, it helped to clarify what my purpose was uh, to be a person that was giving, uh, work in the community, and sought to uplift and just have a life of significance. And that book, uh, as I think back, um, it, it again, like I said, it changed my life. There are so many other books that resonate with me, but when you find something that uh, can singularly identify your passion, your purpose, uh, you know, you know that that is a book or the importance of books um, at that moment. And, you know, his legacy um, will just uh, forever uh, be lived out by me through the work that I do because of what he wrote in, that, in those pages. Mm. I love the way that you said that, because oftentimes the things that we read do stick with us for quite some time, especially when they have a significant impact. They change the way we think, how we see ourselves as a part of history and culture and society. So Ramonda, tell us a little bit about what you're reading or have read in a book of significance for you. Wow, good question. Um, one that really sticks out for me is called Acts of Faith, and it's by Yana Van Zandt. And it's just a small book. It's Daily Affirmations, and I've been reading that book, man, since college, so I would say about 30 years of reading. I think it came out about 30 years ago, So, um, but I love it because there are so many jewels for almost anything that I'm experiencing or going through. If I'm, if I'm struggling with my faith, I can flip to the back, and there's a whole um, um, glossary or index, rather, that I can point to, and it gives me pages that deal with faith. If I'm lacking in self-confidence, I can flip through there. If I'm feeling fearful of something. And so for me, I keep it by my bedside. Um, if I'm dealing with, you know, right now, my <clears throat> having health issues with my dad and, and just really needing to shore up what my, what my feelings are, that Acts of Faith book does it for me every time. And it's a book that I recommend to people. I gift it to people. Um, but it's one that I keep very close to me that I cherish. But that book there is like my, I don't want to say my little Bible, but I, it's something very um, dear to me. And then the other one I would say is Asada by Asada Shakur. Uh, totally different than Acts of Faith. But when I think of a strong, resilient Black woman and all that, it's just, that she went through and experienced, 
in, in her journey, in her life, that one gives me the power and the muster to really stand up tall and really be proud of who I am because of what she travailed and what she persisted with in her life. So both of those books really impacted me in a very real, very rich, very visceral way. And um, I'll keep it, I'll keep both of them by my bedside. Very good reads. I want to double back for a second to Stacy because all of us are talking about books that we read, you know, at various stages and seasons of our life. And Stacy, as an educator and someone who runs a school, talk to us about the value and importance of introducing kids to physical books. What are some of the benefits that you have seen? And at what age are you introducing kids to various levels of book reading and series? So first of all, I would tell anybody who works with kids, parents, you need to start that reading process before your child can even communicate. Because if you're reading to your child daily, you can expose the child to about 290,000 words before they even enter into kindergarten. And that is a phase or stage that um, the, ver the word vocabulary can help with getting you faster to the understanding of what you read and, and so forth. So we should start reading very, very early on. And in terms of, you know, the different types of books you should expose your child to, all kinds, let children see themselves in the book. So make sure you're, you're purchasing books that have pictures and images and experiences that are similar to the child. So the books should be very diverse. And I would also say, make sure that, um, you know, you use the book to, to align the child to the character, like ask questions as you're reading, like, how do you feel about this? Um, how do you think the character feels? That helps to bring empathy and so forth. So kids can read and think about books at a very early age. So the sooner you start, the better. What are some of the skills that children learn when they do read early. I know we talk about being able just to advance to the next grade level, but there are things such as critical thinking and awareness and, you know, objectivity. How do books play a role in character development? Well, in terms of character development, you know, that's going back to, you know, teaching feelings and, and empathy and, and allowing um, good examples to come through for how you would expect children to, you know, interact in the world. But um, you really want to just work on those listening skills um, early in, on in the game. Listening to books helps to increase your listening skills and your language skill development. So it's a lot of different facets that you can get from engaging students in reading books. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask everybody this question because Stacy just mentioned one of my favorite. Now, I like paper books, but I've gotten to that stage in my life where I really don't care for paper because it's just around. The difference between an audio book and physically reading a book. Which one do you all prefer? Derek, I'll start with you. Um, so I do both. Uh, you know, so I have, we have book clubs, podcasts, author interviews that we're doing. So I definitely alternate between both. I'll listen to an audio book when I'm driving to work, going into the office. Uh, but there is nothing like the intimacy that you feel with a book. Uh, there's something about the cadence in which a writer writes uh, there's something about the alliteration, <clears throat> something about the word placement um, that authors use when writing in, in their craft that helps to really impact uh, the story a bit more. So I know there was just a, a book we read for a book club uh, not too long ago, and I had to switch from listening to it on audiobook to physically reading the book because I wanted to make sure that I was getting a full impact of what that author was trying to convey to me. So I think um, if you're not connecting with a book, uh, you know, uh, look through an audio book, I would definitely recommend to a reader to take time out to switch to a physical book because maybe you'll just get a much better connection, much better feeling uh, with that story. Absolutely. Ramonda, what about you? Yeah, I would lean more to physical books. I love creating the voices of what the characters sound like in my own head. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I have listened to audiobooks when I do click them. I'm like, wait, that's that's not how it sounded in my head. Um, mm -hmm. So I love having that freedom, that that liberation to that liberty to just hear the voices as I think that they should be represented in the story. So definitely physical books for me. Um, I just love folding down the pages all day and in, in, in earmarking where I've stopped and where I need to start. But physical books do it for me every time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Dr. Tierney. 
So I vacillate between all three formats, either an audio book, a physical book, um, or even the, my Kindle, where I read the book you know, digitally. Um, and I, I echo what Derek said. It just depends on the book itself. So when I um, listen to Viola Davis's recent, her autobiography, I wanted that one in audiobook because I wanted to hear her voice tell her story in the way that only she could, you know. But there's some other books that I want the the paperback experience or to feel the pages or like um, Ramonda just said, to make the voices in my head of what the character sounds like, even what they look like, you know, and just to make that come alive in my head. So I, I do all three formats. Absolutely. And Stacy, You know, I think... I'm going to say both, but I think from depending upon the age of the child. So if I'm with the kindergartner or, you know, first through second grade child, I want to put that book in the hand. They need the physical book because they need to learn the other parts about a book. You know, the, the front cover, the back cover, the spine, you know, what direction the book should be held. There's so many important things that you should do in that um, book awareness stage that younger kids need. And then as, you know, students get older, if you want to move to the audio books, that is fine because sometimes we should listen to books that are written at a higher level than what we're actually comprehending because that will help to improve our comprehension as well. So um, the audio books are good too for some of the older students as we move along. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing your insights about what you prefer to read and why it matters to you. I think as our audience is moving forward and discovering their relationship with books, it will be important for us to do a little bit of a deeper dive as it relates to going into physical bookstores. When we come back, I want to have a one-on-one -on -one with Derek and Ramonda so we can not only just talk about mahogany books, but to learn a bit more about how they are moving forward and living their dream. We'll be back in a moment after the break. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. back everyone to a balanced life and as you can tell we all have relationship with books and then oftentimes there are books that are given to us that we like to read there'll be books that are given to you that you may not want to read but the beauty is you have an opportunity to discover for yourself what type of genre of book you like I'd like to invite Derek and Ramonda in to have a bit of a conversation about their bookstores, how they balance the work that they do, and the relationship that they have related to working together. Welcome in, you two. Hey, how are you? I am good. I'm glad that you guys are here because I was literally amazed at the idea of a Black bookstore being created content for people of color in a community of color where children could see themselves as they walk down every aisle. Talk to us a little bit about your book journey for starting Mahogany Books and how things came about, um, whichever one of you wants to start. So uh, for myself, uh, it really started um, when I was in college. You know, uh, my mother is a huge reader. Um, growing up in the D.C. area, we always had access to black bookstores. Uh, but there was something um, about uh, my time in college uh, when I walked into a bookstore and saw like the entire walls just like covered with books that were written about our story, about my story. And um, seeing a, a business run at a high level uh, that was about community, that was about um, empowering people uh, and giving, um, you know, uh, that was really about uh, empowering the staff as well. It really um, hit me differently. Uh, and from that time forward, I just knew I wanted to run a bookstore. I knew I wanted to pay forward uh, what all was given to me from the books I found in that space, uh, from my time working there, uh, the mentorship that I uh, got from not only the owners of the store, but also my colleagues that I worked with. And uh, when I got out of school, I was just on a mission um, 
somehow, some way, I wanted to own my own bookstore and put our own spin on it. Uh, so for it, it got to the point in 2007 where we launched uh, our online website. Uh, my wife is from uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it was really important for her to make sure that people outside of the, uh, the D.C. area had access to books before um, as well. Uh, and we uh, fast forward, went to uh, 2017, we launched our physical bookstore. Uh, but the, the entire goal was to make sure that when someone walked into those doors or came onto the website was to give them this experience that made them feel at home, that made sure that, that when they walked in, they understood that their history, their heritage, their culture mattered, that um, who they were as a person uh, was seen and validated. And that's uh, what I got out of books, uh, my time working there. And that's what Mahogany Books strives to do every day. I love that because sometimes we're driven by our life experiences and people don't always know how to connect the dots. So I appreciate you sharing your story. So for our audience who's listening, something may trigger you to say, I have a dream and it can happen, but I need to stick with the plan. Ramonda, talk to us about your journey. Yeah, absolutely. As Derek mentioned, growing up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, my parents still live there to this day, um, just blocks from Black Wall Street. Um, I fell in love with books at a very, very young age. Um, I was reading and eating up every little romance novel I could read. Um, but not until I got to college at Langston University was my world opened up to black books. Growing up near Black Wall Street, I never knew Black Wall Street existed. It was rarely ever talked about in our schools. And so I was missing out on not learning about me. Fast forward to college and um, walking into the libraries, into the Black Heritage Center specifically, and reading books about Asada, seeing Yana's book there was just mind boggling to me. One that really sticks out to me was Dr. Tony Browder's book, Nile Valley Civilization. And that's where I found out what I was contributing to this world as a black person. I'd never seen that contribution before. It was shunned almost from my schools. And so that, I mean, learning about my history, learning about the entrepreneurs, learning about the thought leaders who were part of my legacy. And I say my legacy as a black person in this country was overwhelming. And it was something that made me feel, really feel proud. And so when Derek and I were tossing around business ideas that I was like, hey, hands up, you know, let's do a bookstore. He, it was sorry, something that was passionate for him, but then it also resonated with me. And when we decided to go online at that time, we were in our one bedroom apartment in Alexandria, uh, Virginia with an idea, a dream, and the passion to make black books accessible no matter where you lived. So whether you were in Tulsa, whether you were in Ohio, wherever that was, we wanted people to have that experience of learning about their culture, learning about history and not leaving it up to somebody else. And I'll be honest, when I think about, man, if we had not created a black bookstore, if other people in this space, other black bookstore owners did not create this, this place, then we would be living, leaving our history up to other people. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, a lot of other people may not value what we value, may not value the content and the, the, the accomplishments that we do. And we see that as it's happening, playing out in our schools where things are being pulled. And so I didn't want to leave that up to somebody else, the significance of our history. And so Derek and I said, Black Books is, is it. We're going to do this venture. And he had come from it from a different passion place. I had come from it from a different passion place. But I'm just blessed that it was a place that converged in a very real way for both of us. But it was really stemming, stemming from we wanted Black Books successful no matter where you live. So let me ask you this follow-up question related to books, because we live in such a digital world. Everybody can get anything they want on Amazon and any other place that they can find a book. How? Tell us where your original store is. And I understand that you've opened up a second store, which really reaches more people. How does that impact the community where you have your books? And what does it do for culture when they see the growth of your stores? Uh, so our first store is in my hometown, Southeast DC. So I'm extremely proud of that. Uh, maybe a block or two from where I played as a kid at my grandmother's home. Um, but having a bookstore, a physical space for people to walk into, um, it what people get from that is uh, a, an enveloping presence of culture, of um, significance. And we know that uh, when people come in, they've we've seen customers come in and tear up because of a very emotional um, uh, uh, experience that they're having 
of recognizing that um, anywhere else when they, where they go in a bookstore into a retail space, they aren't seen, they aren't put for, put first, but in a physical bookstore that is writ, that is created for them specifically, they are the target audience. Uh, the community that, the community that we are able to create uh, by hosting book clubs, uh, author talks, or just having one-on-one conversations with readers uh, and, and introducing them to titles and authors that, um, you know, comes from a curated experience from a bookseller rather than trying to figure out what the best keyword is in an internet search. It does something different uh, for a person because they're able to discover more and really just kind of spend hours at a time just digging through the bookshelves, finding that book, that title that is really meant for them in that specific moment. Mm, Absolutely. Now, you said where you were or are or were born in D.C. Now, that is, if I understand, the I'm from Texas. So, you know, all the history when I moved here was very interesting to me. But that is also the home and birthplace of Frederick Douglass. Yes, so there's is. something very historical and cultural about opening up a bookstore in a place where so much freedom had to be fought in order for us to have the opportunity to, to read and to go into a bookstore or to walk down the street and do so many other things. So I can imagine that when children walk into your store, they are learning history, you know, from where you are, because you do book readings and a host of other things. Ramonda, talk to us about the development of the readers that are in the community where you serve. Absolutely. It is just such a tremendous joy to see young people walk into our stores and see themselves on the shelf, right? And what I mean by that is to see covers that are brown faces, are black faces, are beautiful melanated skin. And when I was growing up, I was reading about Jack and Jill, and now kids can grow up and reading a lot of different things, right? I wanted to read about Jamal and Jamisha, for example, and I didn't have that, that, that type of experience to be able to relate to people that looked like me who had names similar to mine. And so to see that from young people, um, the joy on their faces when they see those images is something very important to us. It's one of the main reasons why we created Mahogany Books. Um, we wanted to see ourselves on those pages. And so from young people all the way up to adults, um, as Min- Derek mentioned, we've had, a, I remember him really coming home telling me about a story about a gentleman who walked in our store and he kind of stood at the threshold of our Anacostia store, older gentleman, maybe 60s, maybe late 60s um, or early 70s and stood there and he didn't walk into our store, Jackie. He stood at the threshold and he just slowly looked from left to right and really slowly looked at all the shelves and looked at the books and tears started coming down his face. Mm-hmm. And we walked over to him. I think my husband walked over to him actually and asked what was wrong. He said, I've never seen this many books about us in one place. And so that's what we're doing. So many of us have gone through our journeys not being seen, um, not being heard. And I say that as Black people in in this country, to be honest, um, and to walk into a space where the music reflects who you are, the pictures on the wall reflect who you are, and then the books on the shelves do that um, as well as something that will keep us connected to our purpose for many, many years to come. And so from young people seeing that to um, people who are senior to us seeing that is is important to us in the, in the work that we do. Hmm, absolutely. Now you give me a perfect segue. I want to invite Dr. Tierney in for a moment because you just said connected to purpose. And she's been serving as our level up coach. And oftentimes people have a difficult time staying connected to their purpose. And you guys have opened up a second store down um, in National Harbor. So that gives the opportunity, you know, for people to find you in more than one place. Dr. Tierney, talk to us for a few moments before we go into block three about being connected to purpose and the value in staying true to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I always say that when we lock into who we are, and that can be who you are as a person, who we are as a culture, you know what I'm saying? When we lock into our who, then what we do flows naturally from that. You know, and a lot of times we get so focused on what we're doing that we haven't locked into our who. And so we're just doing all the things or doing the most, and we're not really having the impact that we are really designed to have. You know, we we may be profitable at something, but really we may still feel that void at the end of the day. You know, and so what what Derek and Ramonda are talking about is that they have locked so far into their who that they are helping it helping us to unlock our who through the magic of books, you know, through having this amazing uh, repository of African American literature that's right on these shelves. And it's one of the things that as you were talking, I was just thinking about like, man, I don't think I've had that experience. You know, I haven't walked into a bookstore and just see me on 
every shelf and every aisle. And you know what? I think I might need to go to the DMV just to go stand in the door and look left to right and experience that, you know, myself, because anytime we're going through life, we're constantly, constantly need to be in a space where we're constantly discovering who we are. We're constantly tapping into who we are, be that through an amazing book from someone that looks like us, be that from tapping into our culture, you know, however that, whatever that looks like for you, making sure that you are really tapping into who you are. That's how we start to really unlock that purpose piece. Mm, Absolutely. Life brings us so much wonder and amazement. When we come back after the break, let's continue the conversation because along with living the dream, there's balancing the dream. And we'll be back in a moment after the break. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real uh, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? back everyone to a balanced life and as you can tell from listening to the stories books give us an opportunity to kind of fall into another season to fall into another space to just kind of be taken away by the words on the pages because our imagination is captivated by the words on page I want to ask Derek and Ramonda about that because sometimes balancing the dream can lead to and cause us to feel as if did I really hear God calling me to say, do this, do that, and the other? Are people really going to walk through the threshold of this door and purchase the books? So Derek and Ramonda, talk to us about how you balance your dream. Um, I, I'll, to be quite honest, it's me being focused on people. Um, I'm, I'm a person who, you know, I put a task in front of me and I'm going to grind it out. And what the task is for me is to improve my community simple point blank period. Um, One of my mentors, his mission statement for his business is love. And that really resonates with me because all that I want to do is to leave a legacy um, that means that I helped someone, that the people who sold into me, I'm pouring that forward. So my balance, my, my ability to stay focused and attached to uh, what I'm accomplishing is because I'm able to see the impact that it has on other people. All the other accoutrements, all the other glitz and glamour things, you know, I try to let those things fall to the wayside because if uh, a young man walks into the store and he's struggling with identity, uh, trying to figure out what his passion is, and I can put a book into his hand or one of our booksellers can recommend something, that meant all the trial, all the work, all the heartache that uh, I've had to endure mean something because now that person has a chance to go forth and in 20, 30, 40 years accomplish great things. So that's really how I keep um, my balance uh, focuses because I'm, I'm really focused on the people around me, my community, my family, and ensuring that I'm giving my best, living my best life for them. Absolutely. Ramonda. Yeah. And I'll come from a, from a different angle and Derek is right. People, community is huge. Why we do it keeps us focused, but as a mom, as a wife, then, you know, there's a whole different piece that that gets folded into that when I think of balance. And I'll be honest, Jackie, I think I struggle with the word balance. I've, I've come to love the word um, harmony and having a more harmonious type of home, a more harmonious type of space that where my husband and I and our teenager can operate in. I used to, you know, say balance, everything was 50-50. And now I've looked at, you know, whether it's responsibilities in our home, whether it's, you know, whether it's, you know, it, be, it used to start with Derek has to take out the trash all the time or Derek mows the lawn. Well, for us, if Derek was busy with something, then let me get out there and, and do the lawn or get somebody else to do it. Or if it was taking out the trash, I can do the trash this time. And what I've learned to do is really focus on what works for us, right, in our home and finding that harmony in our home and not let my ego get into the into the space and, and not compare it to other people's. Other people's may have a whole different type of scenario and, and making space and giving grace for them to 
run their household as they want. But I think for me, it was just kind of juggling those pieces and making what works and what feel natural for us and being okay with that. And then communicating it with um, between each other and not assuming, not assuming I was going to do this and not assuming he was going to do that, but talking about it and, and getting um, a space of us being on the same page with something very huge when it comes to creating harmony in our life. So that's, that's what has worked for us. Um, the last thing I will add to that is when it came to our schedules, you know, at one point, I just really distinctly remember Derek was booking things on our calendar. I was booking things on our calendar. And then our teenager had things on the calendar and we were double booking, triple booking. It just looked crazy, to be honest. And but that was an area where we had to work on. So now we probably have about six or seven calendars. I have a personal calendar. So if I have a manicure, it's on that calendar. If we have something that our, our teenager is involved with, in, with band or something that's on our family calendar, then we have our work calendar for Mahogany Books. We have events. So all these different things pieces all work together for us to really have a good glance of what's happening in our lives. And so that harmony came from those things, us kind of tweaking and finding tools that really, really work for us. For some people having five or six calendars may be overwhelming. For us, it works like a dream. And I'm just excited that we found something that really, you know, has stuck with us through all these years. I think that that's an excellent tip. I have five, maybe six or seven emails, and they're for different organizations, different purposes, and they serve their purpose for me well. So I'm going to ask each of you this, Derek, what is one tip that you would share with our audience about discovering either harmony or balance as it relates to self or business? Um, I think I would say it's, you know, one, being true to yourself, um, you know, doing the internal work, asking yourself the hard questions, uh, to really kind of hone in on what is your purpose, what is your passion, and what makes you happy. Um, and just being honest with that. And, you know, I think uh, what I've had to do is to um, come to terms with, not come to terms, I had to just be honest and recognize that what really makes me happy is seeing my wife smile, is being a supportive dad to our teenager, uh, showing up at their events and just being a crazy dad in the stands. Um, those are the things that make me happy. Uh, having uh, some dad time where I can just read comic books and nerd out uh, playing games or, um, you know, collecting pops, as you see, uh, those are the things that make me happy. And just being true to myself uh, and not worrying about, uh, like Ramona said, running someone else's race, worrying about what they do, just being um, happy with the best version of, of Derek uh, that I can be and a lot of that is me giving of myself to the people around me, again, my wife, my, my, my teenager, building a business that impacts people. Those are the things that bring me balance, uh, that make me feel whole uh, so that I don't have to question um, my identity or my significance or what I'm accomplishing. I feel grounded in that uh, my existence has impact. Absolutely, Ramonda. You know, I love me some Derek Young, you know. Uh, we have been married. It'll be 21 years this year, and 16 of those years have been in business. But when I think of, um, you know, what grounds me, what um, balances me, what allows me to do that is, is a couple of things. One, again, having this amazing man in my life for all these years has been a great way for me to feel like I have purpose and the, the goals and the dreams that we're connected to. But I would say also, a mantra that I've learned to live with for many, many years is to really mute the naysayers. There were many people who came to us and said, don't open up a business. Don't do that. Why? People are not reading books or they can get their books from this other site. They can get their, their books to their home in 24 hours. And so I had to learn to mute those naysayers and turn up my own voice. And when I did that, when I turned up my voice, when I turned up what Derek was saying and the vision and purpose we have for our life, it allowed a lot of things to fall into place for us. And so muting the naysayers has been that one thing that has kept me on task, that has kept me focused, that has not had me, you know, my head on a swivel, looking left or right, seeing what other people are doing, but really muting what they're saying. Because I'm really clear that God gave us the dream. God gave us the purpose. God gave us the mission. And not saying somebody else can't open up a bookstore. They were given a different dream, a different way to handle that. But I'm really, really clear about what ours is. And that has kept me centered in a very... Um, a very real way. And it's been very helpful for me to stay focused. Absolutely. I think that all of those things that you stated are very important to who we are and what we do and how we move forward. I want to invite Stacy into this conversation. Stacy, talk to us about 
how people can achieve balance. As one of the things Ramonda said, that there are a lot of naysayers and sometimes you do have to quiet the noise. So talk to us as one of our balanced living experts related to how do you manage to keep balance while living your dream? <laughs> well, I think Rwanda said it exactly perfect when she said silence the naysayers because and when you start listening to all those different voices and have you, you know, distracted and going in a lot of different directions. But to achieve balance, I think that, you know, that just depends on your situation. I know for myself, I have about four major projects going on right now. And um, for me, just listening to my body, listening to my mind, listening to my spirit that tells me you're doing too much over in this area, pull back a little bit and delegate some of that. You're not doing enough in this area, check on this area. Just making sure that you have you know, that you have those checks and balances in place so that you'll know when to put that time into your family, into your business, and, and most importantly, into yourself. So whether you're living in harmony, whether you're balancing, whether you're giving 50, 20, 80, 40, whatever, you know, just make sure that you develop a plan that works for you to help you to know how do you bring it back to the center, which is you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tierney, join um, Stacy because getting to center when so many things knock us off center, whether it's in business, professionally, or organizations and friends, oftentimes getting back on center is not easy to do. Talk to us for a moment about how do you find your center? The first thing is when you're looking for your, your center, don't try to find what your center used to be. A lot of times we make the mistake of trying to go back to the last time that we felt centered or the last time we felt like we had a grip on what was happening in life. And so we try to recreate that moment in time. But remember, that was a moment in time. What your center was back then is not going to be your new center now. A lot has happened. Life is different. Things are, you know, completely different that's around you. So you have to look at where you are right now and you have to assess the variables that you have in front of you to see what is your new center, you know, and in you doing that, make sure that you're keeping your eye on what makes you feel happy, healthy and whole. You know, just because someone else does, you know, 6 a.m. meditation, yoga, whatever. If you're not a morning person, then guess what? That's not your center. You know, find what works for you, what works for your life, what works for your well-being, what works for your household, what works for your health. And focus in on that to help find your new center. Mm. When we come back after the break, ladies, let's continue this conversation because many people get knocked off their center and their, you know, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. But in real life, we fall down and we don't have a ability sometimes to figure out how to get back up again. When we come back after the break, we're going to talk about that. How do you not only find balance, but maintain and stay balanced? We'll talk to two of our balanced living coaches, Stacy and Dr. Tierney, when we're back after the break. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn lives. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Welcome back, 
everyone to a balanced life. And Dr. Tierney said something that was very interesting. She said, don't try to find what your center used to be. That means you have to get back up and then figure out what your new center, your new normal, your new rhythm can be. I want to ask Stacy this question because sometimes you've got a rhythm, you're doing your thing, and all of a sudden, bam, you're just kind of knocked off and you're falling over trying to figure out, number one, what just happened? And number two, do I want to go back to that again because I didn't like the way it felt? Talk to us for a moment about how do we get back up when we've been knocked down in order to be able to learn from our life experiences? Well, I'm going to use a, a recent thing that just happened to me. Um, as you know, many, if you follow my story on social media, you know that um, our school was going through a renewal process and we were marching on along, doing everything just well. And unbeknownst to us, we did not see it coming. One board decided that they were going to recommend that our charter not be renewed. Talk about being knocked off your center, knocked off your feet, taking a hard punch. All of that happened for my staff and myself because we just never saw it coming for us. And um, so to get back centered, one, I had to be in that moment. Like I had to embrace that hard punch. I took the punch and then I had to reflect on it and say, oh, okay, wait a minute, what's happening? And then I had to be flexible enough so that when I got back up, I didn't waddle in what happened. I didn't stay in that moment of thinking, oh, wait, me thoughts or letting all the negative thoughts, you know, enter into my mind and take over. And that flexibility and saying, all right, in this, I'm supposed to learn something. I'm going to, when I get up, have to do something different. So now I need to not hold on so tight to how things used to be because it was pushing me into a new space. And so once I did that, the second board or the final determining board gave us a second opportunity and they said, we're going to reverse that decision and, and allow you guys to operate um, three more years. And in that, everything changed the very next day. I mean, new things was coming at us very rapidly. But again, we had to be open so that it would flow like water. Because if I would have stayed too tense and stayed thinking about the thing that happened three days ago when I got to know, then I would have blocked the blessing of the opportunities that came from being able to move forward. And it's just making adjustments. So being flexible, free spirited, open, and just ready for to take on any challenges that you have coming your way, that helps you to recenter back to self. Okay, so follow up question, because a lot of what you said was mental. And I'm thinking, how do you process those things? Because oftentimes people lose their cool because they don't know how to process. You said, you know, absorb the punch. You said, um, reflect on what just happened and why. Then you mentioned staying flexible so that you could get in alignment with your assignment. That is a mental process that a lot of people, once they, you know, get that punch, they just cannot think. What are a few steps that you did immediately to allow yourself to stay in that zone um, of being ready for what could come next because you believe so much in who you are and what you do? Yeah, so so that process has taken a lot for me about increasing my emotional intelligence because, you know, in the internal part of me, you know, I had a lot of things that emotionally was going on. And if I would have allowed my emotions to get out of alignment or out of whack, you know, I would want, you know, your first feeling is, is anger. You know, if I would have stayed at that feeling, I stayed in the feeling of being mad or the state of being angry, then I wouldn't have been able to think about what is it going to take for me to go next? So I think for me, it was about balancing my emotions and knowing that I'm going to feel all of it. I'm going to have moments of being angry. I'm going to have moments of being sad, depressed. I'm going to have moments of being happy, but I need to, you know, respect the feeling that I'm having at that moment, acknowledge that I'm having that feeling, but then think about what is the next step I need to do to move out of those negative into the positive. So for me, it was that increased emotional intelligence that I've developed over the years that helped me to just stabilize that whole process. Mm, thank you for sharing that. I think oftentimes 
people hear what we're saying and then they try to grab the nugget that they can hold on to that will allow them, you know, if you will, for it to be their anchor or their lifeline. Because oftentimes, whether it's business, professional organizations, friends or family, we're all searching sometimes for that lifeline that can anchor us in order to get back to center again. Dr. Tierney, talk to us about recentering self and being able to move forward. Mm -hmm. So one of the exercises that I actually give my clients to help them focus in on their harmony, it's like Ramonda was saying, that harmony piece or that balance piece, it's an exercise that I give them that they look at the six key areas of their life, professional, relationships, financial, spiritual, emotional, and wellness. And I have them rate themselves on a scale of zero to 10 in terms of their satisfaction in that area. Now, a lot of times what we want to do is we want to be perfect. We want to be all tens, you know, in those areas, but that's not life. Balance, harmony is not perfection. It doesn't mean that everything has to be going perfectly well in order for you to be satisfied in that area of your life. The key is that you want to make sure that you are hitting each of those areas of your life and you don't have any high peaks. So you're not at tens in some areas and all the way at zero in, in other areas. So once my clients take that and they rate themselves, I have them ask themselves some very poignant questions. They ask themselves, what areas do I need to focus in on? You know, where are the peaks and the valleys, you know, in in this exercise? Two, what's happening in this area right now that might be causing some of these peaks and these valleys? Did I get a a health diagnosis? Is there something that's happening right now in my job? Is there some tension or some stressors in my relationships? Really looking at what's actually happening, not what you want to be happening, but what's actually happening. Then deciding, okay, well, what changes do I need to make in these areas? What adjustments, slight adjustments? They don't have to be huge, big adjustments because remember, we're not going for perfection. Then ask yourself, who do I need to include in this area? Do I need to include my spouse? Do I need to include my friends? Do I need to include my doctor, a, a, a trainer? Who do I need to include in this area? And then the last question, what is the time frame that I want to accomplish harmony across these different areas in my life. This is the one that keeps us honest because we could say like, oh yeah, I'm going to stop eating the donuts and do better in my health one day, you know? Well, what, what, when is one day? What, what day is one day? You know, is today one day? Is tomorrow one day? So by putting a timeline on it of when you would like to accomplish this harmonious balance in your life, that helps to keep you honest and actually helps you to move the needle forward. So as we're walking out this balance piece, those are some tangible action steps that you can do right now, today. Again, this is an exercise I walk my clients through to help them to really find their balance. Now, it's not something that you will, it'll happen overnight or anything like that. This is a process that you continue to walk out. Balance is not something that you can just set it and forget it. You know, life is always changing. Things are coming at us fast, you know, and so we never know from one day to the next what's going to happen. So that's why it's critical that we make sure that we are doing this type of assessment in our lives early and often. Mm -hmm. Early and often, oftentimes we get into that procrastination trap. And so early and often doesn't happen. I love what you said, you know, about one day. And I hear this all the time that there are three things that are not on the calendar. One day, someday and any day those don't exist and so you have to literally pick a time and a place and some framework for yourself in order to begin and end so that you know you're accomplishing what you want to accomplish as we prepare to close out this block i want to ask each of you can you give our audience a tip or challenge in order to help them be able to move forward when they do find themselves in that space of having to start anew i'll start with you stacy i think um the tip for that I would leave for today, when you find yourself in that space where you need to keep moving, is to do simply just that. Just keep moving. That's going to be always my slogan because if had I gotten to that moment when I was not off my foot, if I would have said, you know what, I give up and I stop, then I, I can't get to the other side. So, you know, you can't get beyond it if you just give up on yourself. So never give up on yourself. Just always adjust and keep moving. Always adjust and keep moving. She said those two, you notice how they just rolled off her lips. Like you can do this. And I agree with her. You do have to just let it roll off. Sometimes you can't take everything personal. You have to figure out how to get thick skin 
and be able to move forward because running a business, taking care of a home, managing a family and all those other things that are a part of who we are as people in general, just oftentimes require us to just dig in and hold our ground. Dr. Tierney, what is your tip or challenge that you would give to our audience? So it's more so something I want you to remember. Um, I recently put up a post of a quote or something that I heard that said, you didn't come this far just to come this far. Okay, mm. you didn't come this far just to come this far. You know, it's more so I want you to wrap your mind around the fact that you can keep going. You know, we oftentimes get stuck because we think that this is it. This is as far as I can go. This is as good as it gets. No sugar, it gets better. You know, it, it, yes, life is hard. Yes, things happen, but you have to keep going and you have to get that down in your shanana to say, no matter what happens, I'm going to keep going. It might mean that I crawl. It might mean that I walk. It might mean that I run. It might mean that I take a nap today and then I get up tomorrow and do a little bit more. But you have to remember that you didn't come this far just to come this far. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Let me ask you a follow-up question to keep going, keep going, keep going, because people have a tendency to look back and then as they're going, they get discouraged because they do see some of their failures, but they don't see how far they've come. Oftentimes our vision is, you know, skewed by so much trauma and pain that we can't see how far we've come from where we were. Just a little bit about that, if you will, Dr. Tierney. Mm hmm mm hmm so and and now that was a that was a post that I put up not too long ago before this last one. Stop looking back because you're not going you're you're not moving that way. When we're driving our cars, we're not looking in our rear view to drive forward. So the more you continue to look back, then that ultimately will be the direction that you'll end up going. So stop looking back because you're not going in that direction, not unless that's the direction you want to go, which no, not with me as your coach. That's not the direction that you're going. Now, the, the thing about looking back and looking forward, we have to make sure that you are continually, continually giving yourself that grace. OK, because we are our own worst critic. So a lot of times we look back because we're trying to beat ourselves up for the mistakes that we've made or the wrong turns that we've made. But here's the thing. And I think you guys have heard me say this before. I don't lose. Period. I never lose. I make a mistake, whatever, the whole world could blow up. Dr. Tyranny does not lose. I either win or I learn. That's it. So for every mistake, for everything that didn't pan out the way that you wanted it to, for every time that you had a woe is me moment, see that as data. See that as an opportunity to learn learn about the situation, learn about the culture, learn about the industry, learn about yourself learn something and then apply that to the next time you get up and do it to keep going. Because eventually if you keep learning and you keep learning and you keep learning, then you're winning and you're winning and you're winning. So when I tell people that all the time, they look at me crazy. Like, what you mean? You don't lose. No, I don't lose. I don't fail. I do not. I see that as an opportunity for me to continue to get better. And that's why, and that's how, and that's actually my secret of how I keep on winning because I'm learning and I'm winning. I'm learning and I'm winning. So again, get that down in your shanana too, because it's that fear of losing or thinking that you've lost that has you looking back. And really you don't lose. You're not losing unless you're looking back and you're stopping. That's really, that's really when you lose. Absolutely. And to echo something of what she just said, if you want a book to tie into what she said, there is a book by John Maxwell that is entitled, Sometimes You Win, Sometimes You Learn. I think it's all a matter of perspective. I'll give my reflections on that when we're back after the break. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it when you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. 
we don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, wait to $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to PO Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Welcome back, everyone, to A Balanced Life. And as you can tell, moving forward with living your dreams is always not easy. There are going to be people who will not believe in your dream. There are going to be people who will not hear what you're saying. There's going to be difficulty sometimes in getting your point across. One of the things that I have learned, and all of us, as you can tell here at ABL, have learned, is that when we got our call, it was a private moment. It wasn't a conference call. Everybody is not going to understand what it is that you're trying to do. But as long as you are surrounded by people who believe in you, who understand your capacity and capability, you'll have people in your corner who will support what you do. So maybe my challenge and charge for you today is coming through and out of this pandemic, there was something that was on your heart that you wanted to do. And you allowed the pandemic to keep you from being able to live, to dream, to pursue those things that mattered to you. So my challenge to you today is pick up a pen and a pad or a digital device and write down that dream again. Let it live within your heart and allow yourself to be able to see it coming to fruition. And then reach out to people, Dr. Stacy, yes, the future Dr. Stacy and Dr. Tierney or myself, that we may be able to assist you with being able to live your dream and see your plans come to fruition. Go into Mahogany Books located, you know, in Anacostia, Maryland, or go to their store in National Harbor, walk into some bookstore and find some books on a shelf that will help you discover how to write out a business plan, how to live your dreams, how to get out of depression, how to not feel defeated. Whatever it is that you need, there is something that is either in a physical book or an audio book that will help you discover how to get back up and live again. Thank you now for watching. Have a great day. Bye now.